it's a real pleasure to join you all. It's really lovely to be on a Zoom call with many people who I've never met before. Uh, so it's that lovely feeling of, oh, tapping into a clearly a strong community and a new one for me. So great to meet you all here today. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm very aware, as I've been told by Thomas and Sebastian, that I'm coming after many people have presented. I think this is the 11th. So I am going to get very practical today about what we're practically doing and how we're working, particularly with cities and places with donut economics. I am going to start with a donut. I know you've seen it, but I'm going to start with it. I'm going to move fast. And then I'm going to land us in the tools. And if we, if you're framing it around technologies, as Sebastian just mentioned, then what I'm sharing today are, I would say, some social technologies that we've been creating at Deal. Social technologies that make these ideas turn into practice. How do we do that effectively? So let me jump in. Here we go. Let's go. The donut is a possible compass for human prosperity. Leave no one in the hole, falling short on the essentials of life. Don't overshoot Earth's means. Don't overshoot the planetary boundaries on which we all depend. We want to thrive in the green, safe and just space for humanity in between, which would be a regenerative and distributive economy. And reflecting on the donut as part of a pluriverse of ideas, I think it acts as a bridge particularly for the Western mindset coming, it bridges us between a hundred years of thinking that progress is an exponential growth curve measured in GDP. It's a bridge between that and a wisdom that's been held in many indigenous worldviews for millennia. If you look at their symbols of health, of well-being, of thriving, it is a dynamic sphere, right? So the donut acts as a way of, I hope, connecting these well, particularly for a Western mindset, coming back towards something that's known in other cultures. How do we move from a growth-based mindset to a thriving, dynamic mindset? If that's the goal, we're very far from that right now. As all the red, the social shortfall in the middle globally and the ecological overshoot globally. And now just to tap right into what Sebastian was saying. So here are four national donuts, not Germany and Kenya, but Malawi, China, Netherlands and US. So just quickly here, as you can see with Malawi, exactly as he was saying on Kenya, very strong social shortfall. You can see all that red in the center, but not overshooting their share of any planetary boundaries on around one and a half thousand dollars per person per year. China has a double whammy, human shortfall, ecological overshoot. The Netherlands is one of the countries that has a blue circle, which means compared internationally, it is doing well compared to all other countries on meeting the essentials of life for humanity. We know there's deprivation, some within the Netherlands, but compared to most countries, it's doing pretty well, but it's got significant ecological overshoot. And then the US, like Canada, like Australia, even still has some human problems, a massive ecological overshoot. So again, the point that Sebastian just made, I would say, why would we ever call high income countries developed or advanced? There's nothing developed or advanced about overshooting planetary boundaries. Let's put these on a scatter plot of over 50 countries. The place we all want to be is the sweet spot, meeting the needs of all people in the top left-hand corner within the means of the planet. You can immediately see the scatter of countries across this area. Costa Rica is closer than any other. So if any country is closer to being developed by this metric, it's Costa Rica right now. But let's also recognize that although these standards separated spots on a scatter plot, they're deeply interconnected through histories of colonialism, military and corporate power, trade and finance rules, resource extraction, climate impacts current and future. Predominant impacts from the global north to the global south, but much more complexity within. So we need transformation within each nation and between nations. The history of GDP growth has broadly taken countries in this direction, first moving towards the donut, but then straight past it. And this is the trajectory that we need to turn around. So can we create a future of planetary prosperity where we recluster countries? And I've clustered what I'm calling the rise nations, Malawi, Kenya, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Can these nations grow? I believe they will have growing GDPs, grow towards the donut without overshooting it as every country before them has done. That is an unprecedented path. Can the middle income nations, Turkey, Russia, China, Iran, Mexico, can they meet people's needs for the first time already coming back within planetary boundaries as they make major emerging economy infrastructural investments as they're doing? And that's not been done before. Can high income nations, the historically called developed countries, 
I'm going to call them the reduced nations because of all that red shows quite clearly what these nations need to do. They need to come back within climate and carbon and material and water footprints so that they finally meet the needs of all their people. They certainly have the resources to do, but they do so dramatically coming back within planetary boundaries. This has not been done before. Now, what I think is in common across all these very different clusters of countries is that the dynamic that needs to be put in place is twofold from a degenerative industrial form to regenerative and from divisive in economic systems to distributive ones. I'm not going to dive into that today because I know that's very familiar to you, but for us at Donut Economics Action Lab, these are the major dynamics that we need to create. And it calls into question the future of continued GDP growth, particularly in those reduced high income nations. I'm going to park that for now. I'm very happy to come back to it later. It would be wonderful if the world's national governments were actually taking on this strategy and moving. But that is not where the energy for this is coming from, at least with the frame of Donut Economics. We set up Donut Economics Action Lab in 2019 because we were just being approached by so many teachers, startups, city councillors, city mayors, community organisers, local, much more local than the national. And so we started working with change makers in those places who said, I want to start doing this. Let's just go where the energy is and start working with them. And so now I'm going to show you the tool that we've created, particularly around cities and regions, to enable places that say, I want to bring my city, my district into the donut. What would we do? We created a tool that we put in the commons that we intend it to be accessible, adaptable, and impactful as a tool for place. So let's dive in. The question is, what would it mean for our city to live in the donut? Great question. To do this, let's first unroll the donut, literally make some space between the social foundation and ecological ceiling. And you can see in there a very little question, it turns out to be a very big question. How can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? Big, complex question. You can hear that. We divide it into four, what we call the four lenses of creating a city portrait. So you can see that the screen is divided into national aspirations or local aspirations and global responsibilities from the social to the ecological, because we recognize that we have local aspirations of a place, but every place because of globalization and interconnectedness, we are connected and therefore impacting on people everywhere. So let's dive in. Starting with the most familiar quadrant, which is what most places focus on first, most political elections are held around these. How can all the people of our city thrive? What would it mean for the people here, whether it's Tel Aviv or Berlin or Oxford or indeed Nairobi or Dar es Salaam or Dhaka? What would it mean for the people here to thrive? What do we what is the standard of thriving across these all these social foundations of life? How do we devise that and shape that to our culture, our traditions, our history, so that everyone here has a decent foundation for life? Then let's add the other local aspiration, which is how can our city or district be as generous as the wildland next door? This is inspired by mimicry thinking from Janine Benyus. If Janine were with us, and let's say we were in Berlin for the moment, let's all go to the party people in Berlin. She's in, we're in Berlin and we're saying, okay, how can, let's, Janine would say, let's go to the wildland next door take us to the green, most healthy local ecosystem of this place where it's as close as we can say here, this is nature. This is our local nature. Now let's literally take a hectare of the land and measure nature's generosity in this place. How much carbon is she sequestering on this hectare? How much groundwater does she store after a storm? How much biodiversity is housed here? How much is nature cooling the air on a hot day from the treetops to the forest floor? Because these metrics, and how much energy is she harvesting? You can see those in those eight icons. These are the generosities of place. This is what nature does to re continually produce conditions conducive to life. Nature is generous. Nature doesn't do net zero. Nature doesn't do zero. Nature generates. So how can we take nature's metrics from the wildland next door and say with a wonderful ambition, what would it mean for our city or our town or district to aim to be as generous as nature? What would it mean for the city to sequester as much carbon as the woods do rather than release carbon through building? What would it mean for us to store groundwater underground after a storm rather than have flash flooding? What would it mean to cool the air on a hot day rather than have the urban island effect? 
So these are the generosities of nature. These are the two local aspirations. And if you go to some of the richest cities in the world that we belong to historically developed countries, these feel great, right? Copenhagen, Oslo, Stockholm, you say, oh yeah, people have great quality of life here and you can swim in the harbor and the air is clean. So these often feel great. And that is why it's really important to complement this local aspiration with global responsibility, because this is not such a pretty picture in some of the highest income countries and cities of the world. So how can our city respect the health of the whole planet? Now we're talking planetary boundaries. Now we're talking our global consumption of clothing, food, consumer goods, electronics, construction materials that we know have come through global supply chains and the stream of waste that goes out. This is what's generating all of that red overshoot on the national donuts, and it's happening at the city scale too. So how do we transform or massively reduce our carbon use, massively reduce our material footprint? This is where we need low carbon futures. We need material circular economies and all the technologies required to make that work. But also holding with that view of the global supply chains to which we're connected, how do we respect the well-being of people worldwide? who made our clothes, who packed our food, who assembled our phones, people who are impacted by the impacts of climate change today because of our lifestyles. And then the rising prospect of people on the move, continents on the move, because the place where they live is no longer habitable due to climate change. How will they be received as migrants, as refugees? What will be the culture? What will be the policy? But also many other ways in which we're connected people worldwide cities, universities, scholarships programs, twinning of the city, solidarity, assistance, our impact through trade, many different ways in which we're connected. So these are the four lenses of what it means for a city to say, okay, we're aiming for the donut. Let me note, it's complex. Yes, it is complex. But of course, if we ignore any one of these issues, it doesn't go away. It just fails to be managed. And if it fails to be managed, it is very likely to not go well. So it's better to have this holistic vision where we see all of the interrelations. I've really enjoyed being in workshops with city policymakers, city community members, because most people arrive with an attachment to one of these icons. I'm committed to clean water in the city. I'm committed to gender equality. I'm committed to cycling. I'm committed to climate change and carbon emissions. Most people arrive, and when they realize that the issue they care about is on the table, it's visible, it's literally got an icon and a name. That in some way lets us let go of only wanting to talk about that and make everybody else see it and actually the ability to see what other people are focusing on. And then we can start to draw connections. And that's where the really interesting holistic insights and the collective insights come from. So we published this as a tool and it's now being used by over 70 local governments, districts, states, regions around the world. 70 governments that have got in touch with us and told us we want to use this tool or we are using this tool where we are. And my colleague, Leonora Gucheva, who leads our city's work, she, after about a year of this work, she very wisely went through what everything was happening everywhere and said, let us now learn back how they are engaging with this, how they are actually getting started, all of the different ways in which they're doing this. And she's published a report called Cities and Regions Let's Get Started. And she's classified the different ways around these nine steps, some first kind of step in on a journey or committing long-term. And I'm just now gonna show you one example from each of the different places of what this is looking like. I want to acknowledge at this stage that this is early days. This is literally places getting started. So I'm not going to be showing you, here is a city that has deeply transformed. Here is everything they have done. They are getting started using this tool. I also want to acknowledge right now that what often happens is that there is policymakers elected are working in a place who have a vision of transformation. And when they come across the donut, it's a little bit like Thomas said at the very beginning. It seems so obvious when you see it. They say this is a tool, a visual, a compass that symbolizes what we already wanted to make happen. So I also want to be very clear. We're not claiming that people encounter the donut and then get ambition and then get into action. It accompanies them on a journey they already wanted to make. So let's just dive in. Starting conversations. In Ipo in Malaysia, for example, there's an ambition for Ipo to be the first city in Malaysia, in Asia, to aim to be living in the donut. And so they held workshops. 
exploring it with mayors from three cities and in the valley around Ipoh, just starting to explore what would it look like to do this here. And as you can see, they made their own well-being donut from their region of putting in their own values. And this is a really important part of the adaptability of it, that the core concepts of a social foundation and an ecological ceiling hold, but that people bring their own values and connect it with what's already working there so that it's not an imposition, but it's rather uh, adapt to the context. Let me add here, number two, testing the donut on ongoing projects. So in Scotland, they used the global donut to actually map the fact that they had so many different strategies you can see all the way around. And I think this is one of the reasons actually why places use the donut. When they see it, they say, this brings together everything that we're doing, but it's currently scattered across 20 documents, which is just overwhelming. This gives us a macro zoom out that we can show how things, how all the things we're working on and how they're interconnected. And as you can see in the photographs, creating very engaging workshops for people. I like the photograph in the middle. There's the donut and people are invited to put on green or red stickers. How do you think our city's doing on all these different, right? Where are we doing well? Where are things going badly? So that you're inviting people's reflections on as well as the government's plans around transformation. Number three, empowering local change makers. So in Bad Nauheim in Germany, uh, the city decided to create their own vision of living in the donut, and they did it in a collaboration of, of sort of citizens, like a citizens assembly through sortition. They invited, they crowdsourced a uh, hundred people. In fact, they had one hundred and thirty. There were so many people responded immediately, made sure it was a diverse representation of people living there, and then invited them to co-create a vision of what it would mean for Bad Nauheim to be living in the donut. So again, engaging citizens there locally in this conversation. And one of the benefits of the donut is it's not intimidating. You might love donuts or you might hate donuts. You don't have to eat any donuts here. The point is, it's not an intimidating entry point into economics. It signals already, this is for everybody. Bring your humor. It's going to be accessible for us all. Data measuring and monitoring. This is a very common entry point with a lot of places. They see the global donut and the red overshoots and shortfall, and they want to do that there. So you can take those four lenses and precisely say, what is our target for our city on each one of those indicators? And what data do we have or not have that would enable us to measure how we're doing? So here's Barcelona in the process of creating, you can see that unrolled donut and the four lenses, they've set their targets and they're gathering their metrics. And again, instead of being top-down comparison across all countries using standardized data as those national donuts are, and it's incredibly helpful to be able to compare, this takes a different approach that says, actually what really matters is targets that are created by the place and indicators that are most relevant to the place or indeed available in the place. So they're not comparable from one city to another, but they're highly salient and relevant to that particular city. And again, they've done it with a lot of citizens engagement, so that it becomes a very act, a known and engaged tool within the city. I'm going to just give you one more example here, which is Brussels, the capital region of Brussels in Belgium, which are on their second iteration. This is a recent creation of they've made of the donut. They've done it in a slightly different way of averaging three different indicators, but you still get the message of where they're overshooting and surely falling short. And I like underneath the ambition of saying, okay, this is us in 2023. Where are we going to be in 2030? Where are we going to be in 2050? We should be coming back inside. So a clear intention to monitor this over time. And I would love it if I believe there is a future in which we see parliament, parliamentarians, whether it's in a local regional parliament or in a national parliament, standing up, not telling us GDP is up 1.3% over this time last year. So what is that actually telling us about the world? But rather reporting against metrics like these which in a snapshot tell us a much richer picture about the direction that we are traveling in. Going to plans and strategies, and I'm coming to Amsterdam here, which was the first city actually to engage with the concept. So in April 2020, Amsterdam launched their city portrait with the data and said, we are using this, we've created this to put it at the center of our policy to become a circular city. So it became a symbolic, as you can see in the, in the middle diagram, it's the symbol at the top of the circularity policy. And one of the reasons they did it is they said circularity can sometimes seem very technical, very, it's about m moving materials. And actually we realize it's not just about moving materials, it's about livelihoods, it's about quality of life. It's about redesigning social technologies, not only of how materials flow, but of how livelihoods work and how people interact with materials. 
so that we move from owning to using, for example. They created this lovely Dutch orange donut and set the vision for Amsterdam to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting planetary boundaries. I wish every city and country in the world uh, up front could set itself, that is the vision of who we want to become. And then started adopting it in specific sectors, in food, in textiles, in the built environment. So you can see here the projects of social housing. How do we create more housing without simply building more? How do we create a circle and fair clothing chain through denim particularly? And how do we connect, this is within COVID, how do we connect local farmers with excessive produce to hungry families in the city? Can we start to correct that? So again, using the donut to explain other policies that might have been going on, but it brings them together and it starts to drive the circularity. I also want to note that in Amsterdam, particularly at the same time that the city government decided to adopt the donut, a, a wide network of civic organizations said, actually, the donut already speaks to what we are doing as well. We've got many projects underway and they are aiming to be regenerative, aiming to be distributive. So actually, we want to create the Amsterdam Donut Coalition, which is a civic led network. And there's been a healthy mutual pressure between the civic led network and the government pushing each other to keep moving. But this civic network has al already inspired many other civic networks around the world of community organizations. Is everyone going to start doing this here too? And we're trying to get our local government to get started. Moving on straight to projects. So in Norway, there's a harbor, an old industrial harbor, Gronlikaya, which was being redeveloped. And they said, we want to use these four lenses as a way of thinking about how we redevelop this harbor. It's becoming housing and some small industry but let's think about, again, all four lenses in the way we design it. And again, they use this framework, engaging with future residents or surrounding residents of what qualities do we want this place to have? So showing that you can use it actually at a smaller scale within a city as well. Using it as a compass. The city of Nanaimo in Canada was the first place in Canada to engage with it. And they said, as you can see, they've made their own Nanaimo donut. Same core concepts, the social foundation, ecological ceiling, but adapting it to what made sense with their existing strategy, which was reimagined Nanaimo. So they've blended the two. And then you can see on the left hand side, it goes from having a compass to their own goal, to their policies, to the structure and then action plan. So using it as a top level for a lot of different actions that should be delivered by the city and again should be measurable and reportable on and accountable what therefore have we done and how is it changing our position in relation to our city donut? Number eight, decision making and project assessment. So taking the concept and saying we are going to use it as a tool for running through any ongoing project. So in the Cornwall Council in the UK created a decision making wheel. And one example is the Saints Trail, which was planned to create a cycle path running through a large area of the county. And they used this concept to say, OK, given the current design of it, what is it doing? Is it beneficial or are there any negative impacts on the social side, on the ecological side? And what could we do to change the design to make it even more beneficial? So using it as a holistic checkpoint in the process of designing and approving projects. And then the last one I'll bring in here is an additional tool that I'll explain it in a moment. But it's really identifying, going deeper now, really deeper, because into what are the levers of to make transformational change possible. This came out of the fact that when Amsterdam started in April 2020, they came back to us very quickly and they said, if we're actually going to aim for this city to live in the donut, the current structure of our city council and our government is not designed for that. We're just not, we're in silos, our budgets are struck, siloed, we've got growth in our goals, we're just not structured to do that. Can you help us think about how we do that? So we came back with another tool, which I'll very briefly introduce to you here. So we said, okay, what are your powers to act in this place? And in the center of it, we place these five design traits of a place. What is your purpose? As a city council, what is your purpose? What is your vision? I read out Amsterdam's new vision, right? To be a thriving, regenerative, inclusive city. Is that your vision or is it a very old fashioned vision of let's grow our city? What are your networks, your relationships with your residents, with companies, with other cities? with national government, what are the relationships you're in and how are those holding you back or allowing you to propel forward? How are you governed? Who's in the room when decisions are made? How are decisions are made? Are you using citizens assemblies or is it a closed door? What are the metrics of success? How are the 
fundamental sources of wealth creation in this city owned? Who owns the land? Who owns the housing? Who owns the utilities? Who owns the businesses? Are they multinationals taking their profits out or are they small, medium enterprises based here? Because how the wealth is owned, of course, is going to deeply shape how finance is flowing into the city, whether it's government budget or private sector investment, and what that finance is expecting and extracting and demanding, and whether it's aligned with your purpose or actually pulling against it. So what is what about the deep design of this place is pulling us back towards degenerative design of our city, towards a divisive design of our city? And these are just a few examples. And what is already pulling us towards the future we want? There have got to be some things in place that help us, that we've already started doing, a purpose we already have. And how can we amplify those and shut the others down? So we ask, what can we stop, let go of and leave behind? And what can we spread and scale? And you can see very clearly here, it says city in the middle. That's within our power. But let's recognize that every city is embedded in a nation, embedded in the world. And so there are some barriers and opportunities that are far beyond what we have the power to create. But what can we do alone within our city? And what can we only do when we work in alliance with others? So let me just pull right back. This is all summarized in our report, Cities and Regions, Let's Get Started. Those are the nine ways they've been getting started. I'll say it again, we recognize this really is just getting started. Most of these places began in the last two years, last year and a half. So it's a process and it's that tension of, we're just getting started and change takes a long time versus this is urgent. And that's a tension we hold across all of this work we do. But we are continually learning with the cities and regions. What I want to do next is actually start bringing in examples of the policies and the practices and the implementation that these places are putting into practice so that we see what cities and regions are doing, not just beyond getting started, but actually let's get into implementation and into action. And I'll just finish here by saying all these tools and all the other tools that we create are available on our platform. I have focused here very much on tools for cities. I just want to say right up front, and I'm very happy to talk about, we've created a very different set of tools for businesses because we have a very different attitude towards business and it's important to avoid greenwash. We've created different tools for community organizations. We're creating different tools for teachers. So according to who is coming, we create different sets of tools, but again, they intend to be a social technology, engaging people to have a different holistic picture, accessible, but that are leading to action and that ultimately will be accountable. So I'll stop there and look forward to turning this into a conversation. Thank you.